treasure hunt, you may not be off balance. These voyages full of promises and the weather pregnant. In a jiffy, the smoky Nasarawa Egon Hills in sight. And putting that behind us, we set our eyes on Akwanga. To the right was the way to Wamba. Shying away from the mead of the city, we maneuvered and headed towards Quara. A rural road with all its imperfections beacons. Few miles away, we began crossing rocky streams with coolest of waters. That, of course, says a lot about how close we were to Farorua waterfalls. The spirit of communal cooperation was at play. Men, women, boys and girls putting hands together, producing a step of food. The climb's becoming tougher for the SUV, and for me, it was time to take a break off the vehicle. A wild food and the test aura of the beautiful flowing streams. I was in a world of my own. Few more villages aside and a screeching halt for the SUV. Here it has to stop and take a turn. The roll of the four wheels ends. Where are 
We've now reached to a point where the four-legged uh, vehicle has to stop over there and wait for us. And we're now move, move, using our two legs to slap the way up there to ensure that we get to the base of the Farurua waterfall. We will give you details of what is happening when we get there very soon. few meters of walk, we were warmly welcomed into the vicinity of Falurua Park. Stepping across another stream, tips of paradise on earth with breathtaking flora. And the final steps to the base of the waterfalls feels like a step in a portion of the Garden of Eden. And finally, at Farirua Waterfall. What an awesome environment, a beauty to behold, a tourist kingdom waiting to be unleashed for the world to visit. Parirua used to be a tourist attraction because there used to be a lot of whites in the Dem Plateau because of the climatic factor. They were the people that even discovered the Parirua. So they were coming, it was, it was a center of tourism attraction. People go to watch the falls. Now, in 1996, when Nasrallah State was created, the first military administrator, Wing Commander Ibrahim, became interested in the foreign Roar because he has been hearing about foreign Roar, foreign Roar, foreign Roar Falls. So out of curiosity, he wanted to know this foreign Roar. The long and short of it all, the foreign Roar project was then conceived. 
but it was on the drawing board. When Abdullah Adamu came in 1999 as the executive governor, that was during my time, because I happened to represent the area. In fact, I happened to be an attribute to what today is called that Fadun Roar. I started it. The Fadun Roar is a force, like we said. Now, with those potentials that he saw, Abdullah Adamu celebrated his 60th birthday. And that was when he saw the beauty of nature and thought as a government we need to lay some we need to start putting something so that we could attract investors into it so those challenges you were talking about were built by him in fact we even invited some foreign investors to come over they came they saw it they were willing to proceed from where we started but what happened like i kept on saying some of these impediments or some of these challenges that would discourage an investor from coming into being. Like I said, critical infrastructure, accessibility, energy, and so on. That was it. Now, as time went by, not only about the tourism, we also thought we could utilize the vast potential of the force to even generate electricity. So we started the Fanrua Hydroelectricity Project. That one, you need to come right down to the development headquarters at Para, where the turbines and so on were built for the purposes of generating about 20 megawatts of electricity. Then we went further and said, it could go far beyond that. You could even use the water for irrigation. We let all those structures. Then, of course, one of the critical challenges is scarce resources. Government at the state level, you know, with lots of competing priority demands. That doesn't make it attractive for government to continue that investment. And the private sector, like I say, we're not willing to inject funds into that industry. So the only way out is to request the federal government to come and take over. Yes, the federal government accepted. They've taken over that place. Not only the tourism area, including the water projects including the hydroelectricity, the, the entire scope of the foreign rural project was taken over by the federal government. But again, so we are still where we are. What happened? And don't forget, we are gradually shifting away from an era where government now is investing in public enterprises. The best government can do is to create an enabling environment, just like I have enumerated before. It will now be the responsibility of investors to come in. But no investor will come in until and unless such incentives that are given will motivate them to do it. So it's unfortunate the project, like you say, which we started, which the federal government has taken. In fact, the governor, engineer Abdullah Esule, as part of his own contribution to ensure that the entire scope of the project, both the tourism industry, the hydroelectric project, the water dam project, becomes a reality decided to construct that road you drove through from Sisimbaiki up to Kwara, the distance of about 16 kilometers, as for which he did it in just the first 100 days in his office. Nigeria is a country of over 200 million, and we have a lot. I, I don't know how many sites that we have right now, uh, that are both for the world that are on the tentative list of UNESCO and those that are not also on the tentative list and the national monuments that we are having. And also those that are even local in their own areas that both either the local governments promote it through the state governments. So I think the state government, the private sector, you know, and the development, uh, the de development in, um, organizations should also be part of developing this tourism. The Farirua is a very amazing site. I have not been there, but I have seen it in pictures and I've seen wonderful videos about the Farirua sites. I think this is also an area that if we are able to unleash that, you know, either through the government, I mean the state government, then bringing private sector, giving it the basic infrastructures to reach to that site. I don't know how many hours it took you to get there. I don't know how many hours, but I know it's quite a lot. But if we make it accessible for people, I think it's going to draw both domestic and international tourists into the sites.
in any of the sites that we're trying to promote. The community has to own the project. One, they have owned the project in their art, in their music, in their dance, in whatever they're selling to anybody that comes there. Two, you're trying to empower them. So once the community are educated on some of these things that is going to come out of these sites, I'm sure the local community themselves are going to be the drivers of this. So, you know, we have to, everybody's participation is important. We need to make our people understand that we can use culture to promote tourism. We can use culture to promote investment into our country and into those tourist sites or destinations that we have today in this country. For me personally, uh, I will say that I will continue to remain committed in, in trying to promote our tourism in Nigeria. We have been doing that. I have been doing that over the years. We shall continue to do that. Uh, Sukur Cultural Landscape, uh, which happens to be the Africa's first cultural landscape and Nigeria's first World Heritage Site by UNESCO, uh, is one of the sites that we have promoted for the past three years. And for today, we are seeing a lot of interest, both development partners, both local and also international. You know, everybody wants to come to Sukur now to see what we have in Sukur cultural landscape. I was there some weeks back uh, with uh, some of the diplomatic missions. They are happy with what is there. And I'm sure they will take the good news of what we have in Adamawa State. Peace is restored or is, uh, is, is coming back to that area. Of course, there's relative peace in that area. So I think uh, the, the tourism, especially for Sukur, uh, is also one of those that we can say that uh, for now has really, if I'm to put a, a scale between one to 10, I think we're still at four, it's not good enough, but we are still going up. One of the things that also that we have to look at it very well as a country is to see what brought the decline in tourism, in, in, especially in some of the sites in, in Nigeria generally. For me, I will say part of the problems, it has to do with uh, infrastructures. We have to make infrastructures uh, ready, accessible for people to have the basic things, you know, for you to go to any tourist location. Once those infrastructures are not put in place, I'm not sure we can attract even domestic tourism into, into those destinations. So I think we have to look at helping, to, I mean, the government has to look at developing these infrastructures. And also I think um, security and safety, it's key, it's number one. We have to make the world know that Nigeria is safe for tourism. Nigeria is safe for investment. Once we're able to do that, I think we can attract domestic and international tourism into this country. Waiting to be unleashed to the world of tourism are the uniqueness of the Smoky Rock Formation, which lays its meandering backs for the fresh and cool waters to flow. It is a vast natural resources waiting to be exploited, waiting to be utilized to serve as alternative source of revenue in fact both local and foreign exchange earning that could, could complement government efforts. But sadly, like I said, it has been left lying hollow. Nobody bothers about it. Now, what are the challenges? The challenges are a combination of factors. There is government factor, there's government naturally provides an enabling environment, that atmosphere that is needed for every form of sectoral investment, not only the, the tourism, to be able to strive. Government removes any form of investment barrier so that you attract whether foreign or local investor into any sector, not just the, just, just the tourism industry. Government as well must provide critical infrastructure that will drive an investment process. Not just tourism. What are these critical infrastructure? Roads, energy, facilities that will make it attractive, incentivate and motivate investors to come and put in their money. Now and again, there's also the investor factor, the typical Nigerian mentality. Nobody wants to put his money in a long-term investment. People want to put their own money Put money today and you make the profit tomorrow. 
And I can give you an example. Why do I need to build, to use one billion Naira to develop structures of tourism, hotels, when the same one billion Naira, if I place it in a placement deposit account in the bank, I can get seven to 10% of that money per annum. And seven to 10% of one billion, that translates to about 70 million to 100 million per annum. That is enough money. So the Nigerian mentality generally towards investment no, is quick profit. And of course, the foreign investor would not come in here to put in his money unless if there's that incentive. What are the waivers? How does he repatriate? What's the political environment? How safe is own investment? All these are factors. So I think this were, these are, they were and are still some of the impediments militating against the development of the tourism industry in Nigeria. Within the rocks and thick forests spanning miles in and around the park are destinations that could quench the thirst of holiday makers from any part of the world. Though the waterfalls tend to shrink during the dry season, a water recycling system can be used to boost the water volumes for all year power generation. It is obvious that making beautiful destinations falls. Keep my hopes alive.